This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 13, Top God. I'm feeling a little guilty leaving young Krishna tied to a mortar like that for several days. Good thing he's a forgiving soul. In any case, we left off last episode with the last of the vignettes of Krishna's toddlerhood. Now, we'll move into his years as a young boy and teenager. Being tied to a huge rock was no real limitation to Krishna, of course, and once his mother went back to her housekeeping, he wandered off, dragging the mortar behind him. Krishna walked between a pair of ancient trees, and the mortar got stuck. With little effort, Krishna gave a tug on the rope and pulled down both of the massive trees. In an instant, two souls rose up out of the dead tree trunks and began worshipping the young lord. It turns out that these two trees were in fact a pair of guyakas, some kind of spirit creatures, named Nalakubara and Managriva. Many years earlier, they'd been hanging out with some lovely ladies, drinking and having a good time in the river. As they were doing this, the Devarishi Narada came walking by. The ladies all ran to cover themselves up, but the drunken guyakas didn't bother about him and kept singing and messing around. Whatever Guyaka is, Nala Kubara and Managriva were also the sons of the god of wealth, Kubera. Narada was either perturbed at these wealthy and disrespectful young men, or was genuinely moved to aid in their salvation, because he cursed the two godlings to become trees and to stay that way until the coming of Vishnu's avatar who would save them from the curse. And so, when Krishna knocked the two trees down, the souls of these two Guyakas prostrated themselves before Krishna and worshipped him and they were granted immediate salvation. The destruction of these two massive trees was taken as a bad omen. Added to the various demonic attacks against Krishna, the tribe of cowherds decided that they had best move to a new location to escape this harassment. Thus, they moved to a lush region by the Ganges called Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, Krishna, Balram, and the other boys their age were put in charge of minding the calves as they grazed. They spent most of the time playing games, and occasionally fighting off various demonic attacks. These attacks included a demon who disguised itself as a calf, which Krishna picked up and threw against a tree trunk. Another attack was by a giant crane, which attempted to swallow Krishna whole. Krishna made himself hot as fire, and the diabolical crane vomited him back up. Krishna then pried its beak open until its head split into two pieces. The third in this series of attacks was by a demon who transformed himself into an enormous snake. This snake was so huge that the children thought it was a mountain. It lay perfectly still with its mouth open, and the boys all thought it was a cavern. It seemed suspicious at first, but they comforted themselves that with Krishna among them, they would always be perfectly safe, and they entered the serpent's mouth. Krishna followed the boys from behind and watched as they and the herd of calves all slipped down the serpent's throat. The serpent then snapped its mouth shut. The boys and calves all fainted out of fear, but Krishna began to grow. He grew larger and larger in the snake's throat, first choking, then killing the snake, causing snake guts to splatter for miles in all directions. As the creature died, its snake-shaped ghost rose up into the sky and then was absorbed into Krishna. For each of these feats, all the gods would hang out in the sky, sitting in their vimanas, watching the action. Whenever Krishna defeated a demon, they would all cheer and rain flowers on him. From the descriptions we get elsewhere in the Bhagavata Purana, Vimanas sound an awful lot like UFOs. We'll see even more Vimanas later on. Even Arjuna gets to take one out for a spin. At the end of the day, Krishna and his playmates returned with the herd and rejoined their family. You would expect that they had immediately reported the amazing events as soon as they got home. But instead, they said nothing. They never mentioned a thing for one full year. The reason for this was that one member of Krishna's divine audience was the Lord Brahma, who decided to test Krishna out. While the boys were napping by the riverbank, Lord Brahma took them all away, along with the herd, and hid them. Krishna was unable to find them anywhere. It was getting dark, so Krishna solved the problem by transforming himself into every one of the boys and each calf. He was identical to them in every way. Thus, all these Krishnas returned home that evening to their families, and no one suspected a thing except Balram. For whatever reason, Balram was not present during this last adventure, and he was suspicious when all the Gopa impersonators came running home. He asked Krishna about it, and Krishna readily admitted his deception. They both kept their mouths shut about the matter. Krishna was able to maintain this charade, pretending to be a dozen children plus a herd of calves for an entire year before Brahma was satisfied and released them from a deep sleep. Only then did they come home and report excitedly their adventure with the giant snake, as if it had just happened that afternoon. 
The children did not know that they had been captive by Lord Brahma for a year. There's a lesson in this story about Krishna's nature, that he is us and we are him. But there's also a mystery. If he had so genuinely and perfectly assumed the forms and characters of all these children, then why didn't he come to each of the families excitedly and tell them of his adventures with the giant snake? Clearly, there was still something essentially different from the original boys. Perhaps it was their individual egos that remained separate and different from Krishna's impersonations. Vrindavan was a veritable paradise, and when the boys were not fending off demons, they spent their days playing games, singing songs, picking wild fruits, and dancing to Krishna and Balram's flute. Their adventures with the demons continued, however. Krishna's next feat occurred one day when the herd went to drink on the banks of the Yamna. It turned out that under the water there lurked a massive venomous serpent named Kaliya. As soon as the calves and boys had drunk from the river, they all fell dead. Only Krishna was unaffected, and he instantly revived the gopas and the cattle, and then dove into the river to fight the snake. The snake coiled around Krishna and began biting him repeatedly. As the gopas watched anxiously, Krishna broke from the serpent's grasp, swam in circles around the snake, and then leapt onto its head. Standing on the head of the serpent, Krishna began to dance. As Krishna danced, his celestial admirers gathered around in their vimanas and began singing and making music. Krishna was stomping the life out of the great serpent. Soon, the serpent's wives emerged from the water and begged Krishna for mercy. Kaliya then worshipped Krishna and promised to leave the river forever. So Krishna banished the serpent to live in the depths of the ocean and never return. By now, Krishna was growing into a randy youngster, and the gopi cowgirls did not fail to notice his attractions. All the girls were infatuated with Krishna, their hearts melting as they listened to his flute. In the autumn, all the girls observed a fast in honor of the goddess, and went to the river to bathe each morning at dawn, making an idol of the goddess out of the sand to worship, each of them praying that one day Krishna would be their husband. One of these mornings, while the girls were in the river, Krishna snuck out and stole their clothes. I'll let Vyasa tell the story in his own words. When the gopis were absorbed in their games in the water, Krishna gathered all their clothes and shinned into a kadamba tree overhanging the water. Now he called down to the naked cowgirls, his voice full of laughter. My lovely ones, he called down flagrantly. I see that you are tired from keeping such a long vow, so I will not trifle with you. I tell you earnestly, come one by one or all together and take your clothes from me. Though he spoke jokingly, there was little doubt from his tone what he intended. The girls blushed. They trembled to realize what he was saying. Yet they could not be brazen and remain neck deep in the water, shivering. They said to him on the tree, Ah, Krishna, what are you asking? It is not worthy of our chieftain Nanda's son. Give back our clothes, we beg you. Don't you see us shivering in the cold? The older gopis said, Beautiful blue one, we are your slaves. We will do anything you ask. But you are a knower of dharma. So give us back our clothes or we will have to tell Nanda Gopa what you did. He was not perturbed. Without hesitation, he said, If you are my slaves, then come and fetch your clothes from me. Be sure to come smiling, or I will not give them back. And what will Nanda do to me? Nothing else for it, the gopis came shivering out of the river. They came covering their pubises with their hands, blue with the cold. He saw them in their enchanting nakedness and draped the clothes over his shoulder. He said, grinning down at the virgin girls, Bathing naked, don't you know it is a sin against the gods to bathe naked in a river after keeping a vow? There's only one expiation for you. Fold your hands above your heads and prostrate yourselves on the ground, and I will give you your clothes. They heard this command, now full of not just erotic, but spiritual import, from that Mahatman Krishna. Still shy and also excited past reason, the girls raised one hand above their heads, keeping the other between their legs, covering their sex. They bowed low to him. Krishna said gravely, they who know the Vedas will tell you, gopis, that anyone who worships Lord Achuta with just one hand must be punished by having his other hand cut off. Always worship God by folding both your hands together, and you would also please me better if you did that. Uncanny gravity was upon the young girls, a current of something far deeper than their nakedness and Krishna's mocking words. They had heard from him in his supremely ambiguous tone that it was a sin to bathe naked in the river after keeping a vow. Now, they heard the Lord must never be saluted with a single hand. This was a worse sin still. The gopis uncovered themselves entirely, even as souls do while surrendering to God. They folded both hands above their heads and bowed to him, who is the fruit of every religious observance, who washes every sin. Devaki's son, the merry and merciful Krishna, looked at them now, bowing humbly and quite naked to him, and he was satisfied. 
He gave them back their clothes. He had deceived them by saying it was against the law of their vow to bathe naked in the river. He robbed them of their shame by making them come naked out from the water. He mocked them by having them accept his ridicule as a solemn truth. He treated them like puppets, making them fold their hands above their heads to prostrate before him. Yet not one of them felt in the least resentful. All they felt was the excitement of having been naked before him, of being with him now, the bliss of communion. The gopis clothed themselves, but they lingered on in Krishna's presence with shy glances at him. I know the reason for your keeping the Katyayani Vrata, and you will have what your hearts want. There is no sin in what you desire, gopis, and your yearning for me, your love, will save you from being born again into this world of samsara. For a seed once cooked does not sprout again. His smile grew now. Go back to Vraja, gopis, for your vow is over and has borne fruit. You will be with me, dance with me, and make love with me in Vrindavan soon, during these very nights of autumn. Around this same time of year, the gopas prepared for an annual sacrifice to Indra. Krishna went to Nanda and, feigning ignorance, asked him, Father, what do you hope to gain from this sacrifice? Which god do you mean to worship? Nanda replied that they meant to worship the great god Indra, lord of the rain, master of the clouds. He pointed out that all they needed to survive depended on the rains coming each year. Krishna argued, All beings are born according to their karma, and by karma alone do they die as well. Karma gives them their pleasures and pain, their fear and prosperity. No god can bestow any boon or blessing upon a man contrary to his karma. So, to beings who are entirely subject to their own karma, of what use is an Indra who cannot sever the knot of the actions of past lives? Mortal men, the Asuras and the Devas, are all ruled by their natures, which results only from their karma. Who his friend is, who his enemy, his acquaintance, who is indifferent to him, his teacher, his god, all this is karma, nothing else. When a man has his livelihood from one god, but offers worship to another, he is like an unfaithful woman, supported by her husband, but receiving a lover. Never will she or her family prosper. I say, you should perform the sacrifice to honor not Indra, but our herd, our Brahmins, and this great mountain Govardhana. You can perform the sacrifice with the very materials you have collected to worship Indra. Krishna managed to convince Nanda and his fellow cowherds to forget Indra and instead to worship the cows, the priests, and the mountain. Indra was pretty annoyed. At this time, within the realm of samsara, Indra considered himself the lord of the universe, and here was this blue whippersnapper telling people to neglect him. Indra is the rain god, and so, once he saw that the gopas carried out the sacrifice in honor of the hills and cows instead of him, he sent in his apocalyptic minions to flood them out and destroy the tribe. The thunder, lightning, and rains commenced, and all the cattle and gopas ran to Krishna for protection. Krishna began growing larger and larger, and then picked up the mountain and used it to shield his people from Indra's wrath. The storm continued on, but the gopas and their cattle were all safe under Krishna's protection. Eventually, Indra's anger was exhausted, and he relented. Finally, the gopas began to realize that Krishna was no ordinary person. He wasn't even a run-of-the-mill hero. He was truly divine. Even Indra came to this realization, and he overcame his pride and approached Krishna humbly and laid his crown before the Dark One. Indra honored Krishna as his overlord, and along with a divine cow named Surabhi, he anointed Krishna as Lord Govinda, or protector of the cows. If you think back to Krishna's birth and original voyage to Gokula, his father Vasudeva had to make the journey in a heavy rainstorm, and the snake Adisesha protected him from the rains. This would seem to be a foreshadowing of the conflict Krishna would later have with the rain god. In ancient times, Indra had similar status among the gods as Zeus did in ancient Greece. He was top god. By the time the Puranas were written, Hindu worshippers had turned to the more sublime deities Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu as their highest gods, and the worship of Indra had died out. It's taken them a while, but the villagers are slowly figuring out that the blue kid is no ordinary gopa. Next episode, we'll see what they think when he has sex with all of their wives, sisters, and daughters at the same time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>